Hello all. This is chapter 9, Muscles and Muscle Tissue. Okay. So there are three types of muscle. You have skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. There are a few different characteristics of each one. Skeletal muscle are made of fibers. They're striated, which means they have these stripes. Uh, voluntary, and they usually attach to the skeleton. Smooth muscle are non-striated. They're spindle-shaped, which is hard to make out uh, when looking at the histology. They're uninucleated, which means there's only one nucleus. Now, I didn't mention that for skeletal muscle, they're multinucleated, which means the myotubes fuse in development, and you end up with more than one nuclei per myotube. But smooth muscle, these spindle-shaped uh, muscle cells are uninucleated. And then you have uh, cardiac muscle, which are also striated, just like skeletal muscle. But cardiac muscles are branched in addition. Now, they're uninucleated. They're not going to fuse like the skeletal muscles do. And involuntary. Here is some histology showing uh, skeletal muscle. You see the striations of skeletal muscle, and then you see the striations of cardiac as well. So the skeletal muscles are very long cylindrical cells. The cardiac muscle, uh, they're branched, and then they're connected by these intercalated discs, which allow them to contract as one. And then we have smooth muscle, which lines the organs. Uh, it makes up the blood vessels. They're spindle shaped, but you can't really make it out from the histology here. But they're uninucleated, and there are no striations in smooth muscle. So the characteristics of muscle tissue, uh, four characteristics, excitability, which is responsiveness, uh, contractility, the ability to shorten forcefully, extensibility, the ability to be stretched, and elasticity refers to the recoil after stretch back to its resting length. So the muscles produce movement, they maintain posture, they stabilize joints, and they generate heat. These are characteristics of skeletal muscle. So produce movement, maintain posture, stabilize joints, and generate heat uh, as they contract. So the skeletal muscle has fascia that uh, are layers of connective tissue uh, that organize each bundle. And so there is the, the epimysium, which is the outer dense irregular connective tissue surrounding the entire muscle. There is the paramysium, which uh, is also fibrous connective tissue, but surrounding the fascicles, which is a group of fibers. And then the endomysium, which is fine areolar connective tissue surrounding each muscle fiber. Here is a picture showing uh, the bone and a tendon connecting this muscle to the bone, the epimysium, this layer uh, of fascia that surrounds the entire muscle. The muscle is made up of fascicles. Uh, each fascicle is surrounded by a paramysium. And uh, then within each fascicle, there are individual cells, muscle fibers. And uh, these are going to be wrapped in endomysium. Now what makes a muscle stronger than another muscle is the number of cells. So we increase the number of skeletal muscle cells and you increase your strength. Here's another picture showing the epimysium covering the entire muscle, the uh, paramysium covering each fascicle, and then the endomysium covering uh, the muscle fiber. And then we have a, a myofibril coming out in addition to sarcolemma or sarcoplasmic reticulum, which we'll get into. Here's an up close picture uh, of the muscle cell showing the different myofibrils of actin myosin. You can see the sarcomeres here. Uh, they're mitochondrion indicating that this is a single cell 
uh, sarcolemma, which is going to be a uh, modification of the plasma membrane. Now the striations are made up of dark bands, which are A bands, and light bands, which are I bands. Now you see this one is multinucleated. There are multiple, there's three nuclei here, part, part of this, uh, this uh, skeletal muscle cell. So the A bands are the dark regions, and the I bands are the lighter regions. There's then a Z disc, which we'll, we'll go into in the next, uh, here we go. All right, so, so here we see the striations of skeletal muscle. We see our uh, fibers, the fibers are lined up, kind of like boxcars. Uh, we've got our dark A band, our light I band, different nuclei. So the sarcomere is the smallest contractile unit, it's the functional unit of skeletal muscle. The A band and the I band, uh, these are made up of different zones. And so the A band is made of the H zone. Um, these red lines are going to be your myosin and then the blue lines are gonna be your actin. And this is what makes up the sarcomere. And the sarcomere is going to shorten as it contracts. Well, the distance between these Z discs is going to shorten as it contracts. Okay, here's an up-close picture showing uh, myosin, thick filament, and you can see the myosin heads coming off of here. Um, and then the actin that's flanking the myosin. Actin is, is, is uh, kind of twisted. And this is the sarcomere between the Z discs. This is the contractile unit of the skeletal muscle. Okay, a, a quicker look at the uh, filament, the thick filament. The myosin um, heads pop out, and on the heads there are actin binding sites. So this is how they're going to interact with the thin filaments, the actin. And there's also ATP binding sites. Um, this site is going to bind ATP and allow this head to power stroke or to contract and uh, shorten the distance between those uh, Z lines to shorten your sarcomere to produce contraction. The thin filament, this is uh, actin subunits, um, is, uh, there are two regulatory proteins on this thin filament that will cover the binding sites until it's ready to contract. Uh, these are tropomyosin and troponin, which are gonna turn on and off contraction accordingly. A number of problems that can uh, lead to degeneration. Uh, there's Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which, uh, which is an X-linked recessive condition uh, the onset is, uh, is early, two to five years, and the life expectancy is about 30 years. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy is one of the most severe forms of muscular dystrophy, and these are inherited. There's also Becker muscular dystrophy, which actually has, it's not as severe as Duchenne, but both of them involve the dystrophin protein which I'm not gonna show, but dystrophin is necessary to transduce the force. And so you really cannot get adequate contraction. Um, it affects not only the skeletal muscles, but the cardiac muscles leading to dilated cardiomyopathies and arrhythmias. Okay. so. The muscle cell has an extended sarcoplasmic reticulum or sarcolemma that forms these T tubules. And the purpose of this extended membrane is to bathe the cell in fluid, uh, which would, would contain contractile elements like calcium. These 
uh, membranes also invaginate to surround each myofibril so that they, uh, they contract together and uh, you have shortening of uh, different cells at the same time. So if we go through the steps, this is uh, a sarcomere. We got your Z discs in between. We've got our actin and myosin uh, filaments ready. So the first stage is a relaxed sarcomere of the muscle fiber. The second stage uh, is fully contracted. You can see the Z discs uh, have, uh, the distance between them has shortened. The actin is, is uh, and myosin are binding and um, due to ATP, there is uh, contraction. Okay, um, there is chemical ion gating and voltage ion gating responsible for maintaining this contraction. The chemical ion gating would be in response to neurotransmitters like acetylcholine, whereas the voltage ion gate would be responsible for opening during certain voltages. This is kind of a busy slide. Um, but if you look at where the nerve interacts with the myofibril, this is the axon terminal, and produces a motor end plate, which is what we're looking at here. And so looking at the sequences of contraction, starting with the impulse down the nerve, Let's see what the next slide shows. Okay, so the this is a, a little better one. Um, so we're looking at, at skeletal muscle contraction. We've got our, our, our peripheral nerve coming down, um, synaptic vessels with acetylcholine. These are exocytosed into this uh, junction uh, where it is exposed to the sarcolemma in the synaptic cleft. So this is the neuromuscular junction, so neuro muscular junction. And this is actually called the motor end plate. So in response to acetylcholine, the, the muscle fiber will activate and contract, and you'll get what's called cross bridge cycling. So we see the uh, acetylcholine receptors on the sarcolemma that are responding to the acetylcholine and are going to initiate contraction. So when a nerve impulse reaches the neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine is released. Voltage gated calcium channels at the neuromuscular junction open, letting calcium in. Calcium is going to be the effector of contraction So calcium is what's going to cause the acetylcholine to be exocytosed into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine diffuses then, binds to its receptor. And then acetylcholine is, breaking, is broken down by acetylcholine esterase or its reuptake and the contraction uh, goes away and you get relaxation. So the resting sarcolemma is polarized, meaning that there's a voltage that exists across the membrane. Inside the cell is negative compared to outside the cell. So the action potential, which we haven't really talked about too much yet, but this is uh, the change in ions that are gonna allow these ion channels to open. It occurs in three steps. There's generation of the end plate potential, 
which is due to acetylcholine, it leads to depolarization of your myofibril and then repolarization. So that's the contraction. If we look at the electrical activity of a single cell, the resting membrane potential is about minus 90 millivolts. This is a resting cell. By the time it gets to positive 30, uh, it is contracting. This is due to depolarization or a change in the polarity. And then repolarization leads to relaxation. So when the actin and myosin interact, there is cross bridge cycling in which the myosin heads pull the thin filament towards the center of the sarcomere. So the first one is, is cross bridge formation where the myosin head, it's been energized and it binds to the actin filament then we get a power stroke where ATP is hydrolyzed into ADP. And this is what creates a deflection of that mouse and head and shortening of that sarcomere. And then the cross bridge uh, will detach and recoil back to its original position, which is called cocking of the mouse and head. So it goes back to its original position. It will then let go of its, uh, its ATP and it's ready for another power stroke. Okay, the motor unit consists of one motor neuron and all the muscle fibers it innervates. So one motor neuron can innervate multiple muscle fibers and recruitment is when you recruit more muscle fibers with that one motor unit. If we get into muscle twitch, there are three phases of the twitch. There's a latent period where no muscle tension is seen. Period of contraction where the cross bridges form, the tension increases. And then the period of relaxation, where all that calcium that has been released goes back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the tension goes down to zero. And so it's showing uh, about 140 milliseconds for this one twitch. Now, just a little bit of details. The muscle contracts faster than it relaxes. And that's just because it takes a while for the calcium to get mopped up and removed. Different muscles have uh, changes in, in twitch, okay? So you have your very fast glycolytic muscles, like your lateral rectus, and you have your slower oxidative fibers like your soleus. So we're looking at the, the length of the twitch, looking at the lateral rectus versus the gastrocnemius versus the soleus. And so these muscle fibers have different characteristics based on their twitch ability. Twitches can be summed up temporally. And if they reach a certain threshold, that's when contraction occurs. So here's uh, multiple twitches leading to increased uh, contraction and recruitment as, as the twitches uh, are summed up. In the condition of tetanus, where the muscle is unable to relax, there are two conditions. One of them is called unfused tetanus, where you could actually see the, uh, the summation um, 
occurring as it maintains tetanus. So this is maximum contraction without any relaxation. Uh, this is unfused when you can see the summation. Fused tetanus, a little more severe, is just fully contracted without any relaxation at all. So the relationship between the stimulus intensity and muscle tension is that the greater the stimulating voltage, the increased muscle contraction you're going to get. And this occurs through recruitment of uh, more and more myofibrils, which are part of the motor unit. And there is a maximum contraction that is achieved. There's also the size principle of recruitment. Um, larger motor units are going to produce greater tension. So as I indicated, the, the amount of cells dictates the force and the ability to recruit different fibers allows you to achieve the maximum contraction when you've recruited as many motor units as possible. Okay, so in dealing with contraction, um, we're going to get to levers, uh, we're going to get to motor units. Um, so the first type of contraction is called isotonic or concentric. This is when the entire muscle is going to contract. And the load is lifted. Once the muscle uh, has completed its contraction, it then relaxes back to its active state or its, its, uh, its initial state. So isotonic, iso means no change, tonic, uh, contraction is when the entire muscle is contracted. The second type is called isometric, where the length of the muscle stays the same, but force is applied during contraction with isometric contraction. So the length of the muscle will stay the same, but you will still get force in an isometric fashion. So what about ATP levels? They're very important for the cross bridging to occur to get your power stroke of your mouse and head. And ATP the pool of ATP in the cells is what allows you to get contraction without generating more ATP. So it's just looking at the pool. So, but this pool of ATP is uh, reestablished with creatine phosphate. Creatine phosphate will react with ADP to, cre to create more ATP. And this is a very fast supply of energy. It's, it's on the substrate level. There is no dependence on oxygen. So let's say you're a sprinter. You're going to be relying on your creatine phosphate to generate enough ATP to make it to the end of your sprint where you're not necessarily worried about breathing too much. If we move on, aerobically, so dealing with metabolism, 
breaking down of glucose produces your ATP. And this is the oxidation of glucose. This is where the ATP comes from. And each glucose produces uh, about 32 ATP. You can also form ATP without oxygen. However, you form lactic acid in addition to it, which is a source of muscle aches. So if you're uh, a long distance runner and you're not breathing the way you should be, you might go into anaerobic metabolism to still produce ATP for your contraction, but the byproduct would be lactic acid formation, which leads to muscle aches, muscle cramps. So aerobically, glucose is gonna get broken down into ATP. It's gonna happen in the mitochondria. This is gonna produce by far the best source of ATP. This is like for prolonged exercise when you can metabolize glucose. Uh, once again, without oxygen, you can still metabolize glucose, but lactic acid is what's produced and you don't, you don't produce as many ATP. It looks like about two ATP net gain per glucose as opposed to 32 with uh, aerobic or with, uh, with oxygen. So if we take a look at this, we've got the six second sprint, which we've got enough ATP stores and creatine phosphate to maintain that six seconds, 10 seconds. But if we extend our sprint to 30 or 40 seconds, we're then going to have to rely on the breakdown of glucose. If we're not, if, if it's a, a real quick sprint, uh, we're not doing a lot of breathing, then the ATP can be derived anaerobically at the expense of lactic acid. Or prolonged duration exercise would involve a lot of aerobic activity. So you're breaking down glucose to produce ATP in the presence of oxygen. And you're not producing your lactic acid. Okay, so factors that increase the force of skeletal muscle contraction. There's high frequency stimulation, which uh, is just contraction and contraction and contraction without relaxation. You can get uh, tetanus that way. There's recruitment, so larger numbers of muscle fibers can be recruited. The fibers itself can hypertrophy to get larger. This would also help contraction. And then looking at, at the different lengths of the sarcomere, so this is the factors, the factors that affect contractility. So the increased muscle fibers you have, the increased contractility, the more hypertrophy these muscle fibers are, the increased contractility, the larger numbers of recruitment of muscle fibers, increased contractility. Now there's a length tension relationship with the sarcomere. The sarcomere can be stretched excessively, which leads to decreased force of contraction or the sarcomere can be shortened uh, in its relaxed state, which does not produce tension, produces very little tension, but there is an optimum length. And so uh, the optimum length is between 80 and 120% of the resting length. So this is a length tension relationship when you can overstretch this sarcomere at the expense of contraction. 
So the factors influencing velocity and duration are the type of fibers. There are these, there are different fibers, there are at least two. There's fast glycolytic or slow oxidative. Now when we refer to glycolytic, we're referring to breakdown of glucose without oxygen. This occurs much more rapid than, than the oxidation of glucose, which produces far more ATP. So fast glycolytic fibers are going to fatigue very rapidly, but they're going to, they're going to produce the greatest force in the shortest distance of time. The slow oxidative fibers, remember you're going to your mitochondria, you're producing your 32 ATP. So it's, 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 it's not going to be as acute a contraction, but it's going to be fatigue resistant so you can contract for a longer period of time. So let's say you want to lift a load with your bicep. You might be predominantly using your fast glycolytic fibers. How about your postural muscles that need to stay contracted for hours? Well, these might be your slower oxidative fibers. So they're fatigue resistant. So you can stay contracted for longer periods of time. This is a, not a bad table looking at your uh, different types of fibers, slow oxidative, fast glycolytic, looking at the speed of contraction. So the oxidative refers to the use of oxygen. It would be aerobic. So you can spend some time on this table. Just real quickly, since the oxidation of glucose is occurring in the mitochondria, your slow oxidative fibers are gonna have more mitochondria in them, whereas your fast glycolytic are not gonna be as dependent on mitochondria. So the fast glycolytic fibers will have fewer mitochondria. And this actually does affect the color of the muscle fiber. So slow oxidative fibers and fast glycolytic fibers. There is an influence of load on duration and velocity of the muscle shortening. The greater the load, the briefer the duration of muscle shortening, which, which does make sense. And so you've got this this velocity of shortening versus load relationship where the velocity of shortening is greatest with zero load and the shortening goes to zero when there is load too great to, uh, to lift. So let's go to smooth muscle a little bit and look at innervation. Smooth muscle is innervated with autonomic fibers. These are called varicosities and they're going to release neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft, which are going to promote relaxation or contraction of the smooth muscle. Now calcium is very important for contraction for smooth muscle as well. And so there's a very developed sarcoplasmic reticulum in smooth muscle. The sarcoplasmic reticulum has a lot of calcium in it and it's going to bathe the cells in calcium when this calcium channel opens. It's going to open in response to a depolarization.
Smooth muscle cells also have gap junctions that connect them. This allows the uh, transfer of small species as well as charge so that when one cell contracts, uh, the, the adjacent cell can contract as well. Here is a contracted smooth muscle. You can see it still has its, its shape. Okay, I think we lifted this one already. Okay, so yeah, so this, these last uh, slides are, are just repeats and go through them. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at the sequence of events with smooth muscle contraction. So the calcium ions enter the cytosol through the calcium channels, which are voltage gated. And so when there is a depolarization, the calcium channels are going to open. This is what's going to allow some of your regulatory molecules, like calmodulin, to become activated. This is going to lead to the power stroke of the mouse and head producing contraction. Okay, so we indicated that skeletal muscle are multinucleated, and that's different than smooth muscle or cardiac, which are uninucleated. Now the reason they're multinucleated is because in development, the myoblasts actually fuse. So they form a larger muscle fiber with multiple nuclei. Muscle tissue can be regenerated. There can be hypertrophy, which is to increase the size of the cells or hyperplasia, which is increase the number of cells or a combination of hyperplasia and hypertrophy. Now the muscle tissue uh, cannot undergo mitosis. They are uh, terminally differentiated. But there are stem cells that can be activated and lead to proliferation, uh, proliferation and differentiation into more muscle cells. Aging is, is interesting with muscle. So the muscle strength and flexibility with age simply decreases. Reflex is slow. The number of oxidative fibers, the number of slow oxidative fibers will increase with age. And so your fast twitch fibers will actually decrease. So in the young, um, there's a number of myoblasts, a number of mitochondria, um, as you get older and more sedentary, uh, you lose your muscle cells, you lose your mitochondria, you lose your ability to uh, generate ATP, and therefore a sustained contraction. Okay, the next video will be on the types or the different kinds of muscles, and we will go through all the muscles in one video. All right, see you then.